A week ago at Riverside, Al Holbert learned a lesson. Well, we learned we're not so smart because we haven't been able to figure it out yet. At Riverside, Holbert and crew watched helplessly from the pits as driver Chip Robinson fought his ill-handling Porsche and the Jaguar closed in. I felt totally helpless. And, uh, the car had given up grip. The tires were worn out. We were wearing out tires about every 20, 21 laps. And that stint, I had to go 30 laps on the set. And there was just no grip left. And so to the Jaguar team went the well-earned victory and to the defending champions from the Lowenbrow Porsche team, sudden defeat. But another day brings another race. Today, the Camel GT Series and ESPN have come to historic Monterey, California. But there are some new faces as veteran David Hobbs will take over the 900 horsepower Nissan, a car that will carry a very special message into this race. Get well greetings to EFR, Elliot Forbes Robinson, the Nissan lead driver who suffered a very bad race at Riverside when a tire cut at top speed. Despite a devastating accident, Elliot Forbes Robinson came away with but a broken shoulder, and his team will carry on today at Laguna Seca Raceway here on ESPN. 1958, the crowds have been flocking to the hills above Monterey, California for some of the best motorsports in the world, and today is no exception. Hello everyone, I'm Bob Barsha, welcoming you to Laguna Seca Raceway in historic Monterey, California, where we're ready for round six of the most exciting, exotic, and fastest sports car racing in the world, the International Motorsports Association Camel Grand Prix Series. Today, it's the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix, 300 kilometers for a record field of 25 high-tech prototype race cars, and the tension level in the pits is higher than it has been all season long. The reason for that is, for the second year in a row, crashes have changed the complexion of this race at Laguna Seca. Let's take you back again to a week ago at Riverside, California. As Elliot Forbes Robinson took his Nissan prototype into turn one at better than 170 miles an hour, picked up a piece of track debris, the tire shattered, and the car was propelled into the pit side wall at tremendous speed. The car has been put on the shelf. Elliot is okay, coming out of it with a broken shoulder, but they've had to resort to a backup car with all 900 horsepowers, and endurance veteran David Hobbs has had to get used to that car. Less publicized, but certainly no less devastating to the team involved was the Buick Hawk. Jim Crawford got in just a couple of laps of qualifying before a suspension park broke, wiping out the front end of that car. The team has had to work all week long to get it ready for Laguna Seca, but ready it is, and it is a big surprise in qualifying. Join me to help analyze today's race as the fastest female race driver in the world from the Ford GTO team, Lynn St. James. And Lynn, you were involved in a devastating crash at Riverside last year. You had to get the team ready to come to Laguna Seca. What's it like having to go through that kind of a thrash? Well, these crews have to work so incredibly hard just to do the normal preparation on a back-to-back -back series like this. And when you've got a crash like that and you wipe out a chassis, it puts an extra burden on them. Some teams are fortunate enough to have a backup car, but that car is never really as race prepared as the normal chassis. And other teams don't have a backup car, and you're talking about 24 hours those crews have to work day after day to get that car ready to be able to, to race it again. Well, the Nissan certainly had a backup car. The Buick team did not, but both teams are here to race. And for a further comment, let's go to our other analyst for today's race, Tom Blackaller, who's climbed out of his Camel Lights entry to join us in the booth. Tom. The leaders have found themselves back in the pack. Qualifying has been quite a surprise. I think this is going to be the most competitive GTP race of the year, Bob, because the qualifying hot shoes like Jim Crawford in the 1,000 horsepower Buick Hawk, Cyril Vandermeer in the equally powerful Corvette have taken a back seat to the tremendous qualifying effort of Price Cobb in the Porsche. I think this race has potential to have the top five cars run right in a pack for the whole 300 kilometers. Well, both of our surprise front row sitters, Jim Crawford and Bryce Cobb, are standing by. Gary Lee and Marty Reed are down there. Let's go to Marty with Bryce Cobb. The man who has stepped to the head of the class for this weekend's race is Bryce Cobb, running the number 16 Dyson Porsche 962, your first pole position, your second time, or actually you've won here twice. What about this racetrack? You seem to like it. The car is working real well. How's your confidence level? After Atlanta, you said, oh, I'm still not real confident. Well, I mean, I'm confident, but I, I also know that my ability has not returned back to what I think it could be. I'm not driving as well as some of these guys, so I try to get the car to help me through the, the rough spots. But I think it'll be an outstanding race, and I'm looking forward to it. I think uh, the Porsches will probably figure in the end. The start will be interesting because of the turbo cars, the big ones, the Buick and the Corvette, but I'm looking forward to being well-placed at the end. Well, the rest of this field has lots of confidence in this guy's abilities. Let's go to Gary Lee with the other man on the front row. 
Jim Crawford, the Buick Hawk, starts outside the front row. The team really had to work after that uh, damage you did to the car last week at Riverside. Lots of very, very late nights, yes. Yeah. Now, it's been a dry spell for this Hawk. It's been starting up in front in the past. It's led, it's won, but not for about a year. Yeah, well, we changed cars at the end of last year, and they never come together easily. All of a sudden now, we've got the engine installation problems worked out, and we're working on the chassis, so we're beginning to see results. Obviously, the big smile says he's ready to go racing, starting outside the front row is Jim Crawford. And so the surprise front row will lead 25 of the fastest cars of the world to the green flag here at Laguna Seca in just a matter of moments. Today's ESPN coverage of the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix is brought to you by BF Goodrich Radials. We make your car perform. By Pontiac, America's road car company. Pontiac, we build excitement. By Bush Beer, the beer with a taste as smooth as its name. And by Quaker State Motor Oil. New Quaker State with QSX keeps your engine cleaner to last longer. We'll be back to take a closer look at this 1.9 mile Laguna Seca Raceway circuit and get our grit set in just a moment. Seca Raceway in Monterey, California, a part of ESPN Speed World's continuing coverage of the International Motorsports Association Camel GT Series for 87. I'm Bob Varsha, and as we await the start, the order to fire engines, let's take a look at the way they'll line up for today's 300-kilometer event. On the pole in his first pole-winning effort in the Camel GT Series, Price Cobb in a Porsche 962, alongside perhaps the bigger surprise, Jim Crawford, a Buick Hawk. He turned a wheel for the first time on Friday and is on the outside of the front row. Inside row two will be Cyril Vandermerva in the Chevy Corvette, alongside another qualifying specialist, Klaus Ludwig, who won this race flag to flag a year ago. He'll be driving a Porsche. Inside row three will be Chris Neifel starting off in a Porsche. Brian Redman may relieve later on. Outside will be 47-year-old David Hobbs of Great Britain in the Nissan GTP Turbo. Row four will have Bob Wallach on the inside. He may share with Darren Brassfield. Al Holbert will be alongside the five-time Camel GT champion. Row five will have Scott Pruitt inside and a normally aspirated Ford Mustang GTP. Pete Halsmer may get in there. Outside will be Chip Robinson in the second Lowenbrow Team Porsche. Row six will have Hurley Haywood, the winners last week at Riverside, California in the Jaguar. Outside, Jim Adams will start John Hotchkiss Porsche 962. Looking back through the field, Don Bell will start his Pontiac Fiero GTP, the pole sitter in the Camel Lights class alongside Bruce Levin. Row eight will have Charles Morgan in a Fiero GTP alongside two-time series champ Jim Downing. Steve Durst will start inside row nine alongside Steve Phillips. Calvin Fish will make a debut effort in a Buick Alba alongside Chip Mead. Lights car. Row 11 will have Bob Lesnet and Scott Schubot. Row 12, Terry LaBelle alongside Ron Canizares. And bringing up the rear in the field, Howard Cherry in another Porsche powered Camel Lights entry. 14 GTP cars in this event, 11 Camel Lights. Once again, it is a record field here at Laguna Seca. Let's take a moment now and take a lap of this 1.9 mile circuit and see how it lays out. For nearly 30 years, the 1.9-mile, nine-turn layout of Laguna Seca Raceway has challenged one generation of drivers after another. Tom, how about taking us for a lap? This is a very challenging course, Bob. Up underneath the Nissan Bridge, the cars are in second, third, fourth, and now fifth gear, heading down into turn two at 160 miles an hour. A light lift and tap of the brakes, back hard on the throttle for the shoot between turn two and turn three. Turn three is one of the tougher turns on the course, taken almost flat out in these big cars. Then up under the bridge into turn four, downshift to fourth gear, hard on the throttle around turn four, and don't hit those alligators on the right. Up to the crest of the hill, approaching turn five, the cars are up to fifth gear, coming actually off the ground, settling down, hard braking for turn six, the notorious corkscrew. Down a 20 degree grade, almost like falling off a hill, third gear, almost up to fourth gear, light braking around turn seven, and down the chute between turn seven and turn eight. Once around turn eight, you have to look out for that wall on the left, which was put there to contain the Indy cars. Heartbreaking in turn nine, first, second, third, fourth gear up under the Nissan bridge at start finish. And that completes the lap. And we expect to see most of our passing in that heartbreaking area just outside turn nine. And now it looks like we're about ready to turn them loose. But before you do that, Lynn, 
A lot of those turns, as we could see on this racetrack, are really pretty blind, and that means the drivers are going to need help to find out what's ahead around those turns. That's right, Bob. Of course, we always have corner workers at all racetracks, but particularly here, they are very important. Uh, besides showing a yellow flag, which is going to determine if there's a car off the road or a car spun, they also have to display blue flags, and particularly when you've got the camel lights and the camel GTPs running. So they're doubly important here. We really, we really rely on them. It, it's sort of, if you can imagine driving through a tunnel at 150 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden when you come out and you've got that light right there, those corner workers, you, you look for that flag to make sure you've got a clear track ahead. Well, last year we certainly saw an example of what can happen as a car got off course on the very first lap of the race, came back on, tangled with Al Holbert, and that certainly helped Klaus Ludwig move out front and eventually win the race. We'll be back to fire engines and turn them loose in the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix right after these words. are rolling off the grid for the start of this 300 kilometer event really something of a sprint race for these endurance built machines and tom that's got to be on the mind of every crew as they go out here the tires the brakes setting up the engines the total car situation i would imagine is entirely different for this kind of a race uh, these cars are generally set up for endurance however this is a sprint race it'll last no more than an hour and 40 minutes and uh, there are some great drivers up in the front i was talking to klaus ludwig before the start of the race and the 10 car is now not being able to start and uh, he's got to get himself going if he can catch up with the back of the pack he can start talking with klaus ludwig before the race and ludwig tells me that he thinks this race will be settled in the first 15 minutes so look for Klaus Ludwig in the 85 car to try to win the race in the first 15 minutes. That's what he thinks is going to happen. An amazing conflict in personalities in one man there. Klaus Ludwig, three-time winner at Le Mans. The absolute epitome of endurance driving, patience, courage, anything else you care to name. And yet, he is the winner in this race last year in a short sprint race. I mean, he just went out and motored away from this field. I mean, talk about patience. He was gone. He didn't want to see anybody the rest of the day. Turns out he never did. But this guy is really the story right now in the bright orange number 16 of Dyson Racing. Bryce Cobb, a man who knows this racetrack well. He has won three different races on three different types of cars at this racetrack. He has never won in these big prototype machines, but Bryce Cobb is uh, no sleepwalker around here. He really knows what he's doing. Now, as we ran down the grid, you heard me mention that there are two drivers assigned to a lot of these cars as we watch the Adams Hotchkiss Porsche. They're saying now they have a dead battery in that car. They're going to try to make a switch, but they're obviously going to have to start from the back of the pack. Tough year, tough start for them, and, and what's been a pretty hard year. They crashed hard at Miami. Keep in mind that I mentioned that two drivers are assigned to many of these cars. No team has ever won this race at Laguna Seca by changing drivers. And so there is a strategic decision that the teams are going to have to make. If you've got a couple of drivers in competition for a driving title, they want to score some points. They might want to make that driver change, but it could cost them. Off of turn nine now, Bryce Cobb will lead the field down alongside is Jim Crawford. The green flag is out there, spooled up, and Bryce Cobb really got snookered at the start. Well, he did. Uh, Crawford and the Buick really got that jump on that start. It's a very clean start, though. And there you see them down into turn two and up into turn three going through the gearboxes. Jim Crawford leads the way in the number 45 car. Klaus Ludwig is uh, trying to make that race right. He just said and he's already in second place. So he definitely took a clean, a clean jump right there. Klaus isn't going to let any uh, grass grow under his feet. Like he said, he's going to uh, keep right up there as fast as he can in the, in the first 15 minutes. I drove with Klaus last year and being part of the four team, uh, I have to say that I think he is the consummate driver, as you were commenting about, Bob, because he, can, he knows what it's like to do an endurance race, but it's obvious right here he knows what it's like to run a sprint race. Klaus Ludwig, he's driving a car that was driven to victory in the 12 hours of Sebring earlier this year by Yoke and Moss and Bobby Rickle, and Ludwig down under Crawford under braking. He's going to win it the first lap. Oh, my. A tremendous passing move there as Klaus Ludwig dove under Jim Crawford and the Buick and the Porsche. Klaus Ludwig out of Bonn, West Germany is out front. Quickly, those two cars open up a gap of about 10 car lengths to Price Cobb. Presently no shown in second, at third that is, having taken third place away from the Corvette. Let's take another look at that pass, Lynn. 
it was an absolute braking maneuver there. Klaus was very, very ready. I think that Crawford was probably just, his tires may not have been warmed up as much. He may have been, you know, wanting to go for just a clean entry into uh, turn nine, but Klaus was going to go for that pass. Tom, how much of that is lack of familiarity with his car? We mentioned that they have crashed the car before. They've done a lot of development work on it. They haven't got very many racing miles in on the car. Maybe he just wasn't sure what the car would do in that tight situation. Well, Crawford has more power than Ludwig does, and uh, but the power doesn't make any difference when they're coming in under hard braking to that hairpin. And Klaus is really unreeling that car right now. He is going as hard as he can. Here's a good look from inside the number 67 BF Goodrich Porsche being driven by another short distance sprint race master, Bob Wallach of Strasbourg, France. Up ahead is David Hobbs, the 47-year-old endurance veteran from England in the Nissan. Great view under the bridge, over the turn one hill, and down into that sweeping left-hander. 150 tank. miles an hour right there, Bob. Now he's back on, probably going 160, 165 miles an hour right here before turn three. Woo, that's you, exciting. You saw that little dark patch just outside turn two. They have added pavement to that turn in order to give these big 700 to 1,000 horsepower cars the opportunity to make that turn, and we've got problems on the front side. In the most dangerous part of the track, the entrance to turn two, the number six, Fierro Pontiac, has been hit by another uh, camel-like car. Now they're trying to dodge parts in the middle of the track. Everybody seems to have cleared out, but the number six car will be out of the race. Uh, that's a camel-like uh, Fierro. Looks like his nose there that just is laying in the middle of the track. There you see it, the number six car being driven by Charles Morgan and Jim Rothbarth. Now that was a car that was going to make a driver change because they are in the running for Camel Lights points. Although it looks like the car is in pretty good shape. You see, you see the tire streaks along there. He got onto the dirt. I don't think he hit the wall, but you're right. The nose did come off. He may be able to get back into it. There's the debris on the racetrack as you see our in-car camera making its way down through turn two. The caution flag is out. They'll have to go out and pick up that piece of debris. We have one brave corner worker that's going to have to run out there to pick up that debris. Yeah, this will pull a full course yellow, which will bring the pace car out to get that piece of the number six car out from the middle of the track. That's the second race in a row that the number six car has been put out with a major crash. In Riverside last weekend, he hit turn six head on, went straight up into the wall. So they are having a tough two weeks uh, in the number six camel light car of uh, Morgan and Rothbard. That was Jim uh, Rothbard that had that accident at Riverside. Now Charles Morgan has had his problems, so I guess they're sharing their bad luck in that car. He just was, he's pulling in the pits right now. The way I, when we saw it on the camera before, the front uh, wheels still look pointed straight. Like, you know, he might have just lost the nose. Be able to replace that nose. If we can get down to Marty, maybe they can tell us. It looks as though they are going to be able to make the change. Very clean uh, breakaway as far as that nose section is concerned. They have one piece on the driver's side. Over on the right side, they're trying to break away some of that fiberglass. Uh, Charlie Morgan keeping the revs up, trying to keep the car from stalling. We can point out also this uh, full course yellow is too soon for the Corvette, which has to make two stops to be able to come in now. So they still need another yellow, full course yellow to try and get back on the same number of Thank you, Marty. Great point. They needed a pit stop for a lot of these big GTPs to get the fuel and tires they need, but they certainly didn't need a caution this early, just four laps into the race. We'll be back to Laguna Seca for more of the Budweiser Camel GP after this. by Charles Morgan's the Camel Lights car has slowed up this field under caution. There's a look at the top five as they presently stand. Let's go down to the pits right now in Gary Lee. This is something that perhaps Lynn could amplify on. We were talking to Jim Crawford earlier, and he said despite his good qualifying time, they're utilizing a large turbocharger, the same one they had at Daytona. Consequently, they have some turbo lag coming through turn nine, or where they burp the throttle over in turn four. That could be a major development if the racing is close late. That's a good point. That's probably why Klaus was able to get by him so easily there in turn nine. He had a, a that lag, and he just couldn't get off the turn as well. Okay, back under green, and Klaus Ludwig is back on the hammer in a big way as he opens up a quick 10-car gap, although that Buick starts to spool up and draw him in. Bryce Cobb, a strong third place right now, and the Chevy is chasing him. I think Bryce might be mad because he got stuckered on the start, and he's now going to try to make up for it. I think maybe his, his energy 
energy level had time to collect himself possibly with that uh, yellow out there and he looks like he's charging now. A continuing story this year among the Porsche drivers. Keep in mind this is a car that has dominated the series winning 36 races since its debut in 1984. The Porsche 962. They are now using two spark plugs per cylinder on these flat six cylinder engines and a lot of the Porsche teams are having problems getting it quite down. They're going to have misfires at Road Atlanta. That might have cost Al Holbert a shot at the victory. Misfire problems again at Riverside. The Porsche drivers are really having to relearn these engines. Bob, the, I noticed in the last time through lap uh, through turn two, the uh, Sarah Vandenberg car tried to pass Price Cobb. There he goes again, sucking right up to the back of him. And uh, you can see the Corvette is not going to want to stay behind the number 16 Rob Dyson Porsche driven by Price Cobb. It looks like they've got the wick turned up on that Corvette car. And uh, I would look for him to move up through the field. There you see straight line as car six is back in the pitch. Charles Morgan is apparently having more problems. They're using a mallet to get those body work uh, uh, stays back into place on his car, but it looks like it's not a handling problem. Purely cosmetic at this point for Charles Morgan. Bob, I think he hit the wall a little harder than uh, we thought. He was, he spun clear around, did about two 360s and knocked the nose off his car, and I can't believe that his chassis stayed straight or that his uh, the car will go the rest of the race. Here's Klaus Ludwig now with a nice tidy lead uh, over Jim Crawford. Crawford's holding up for, uh, Bryce Cobb just a little bit. I would say the 45 car is not the best turn on the racetrack. That tight turn nine hairpin and Jim Crawford, the Indy veteran who will go on to Indianapolis where he'll have a busy month of May as he runs the Buick March house car in the 500 if he can qualify. And you'll see a lot of that qualifying right here on ESPN. But right now Crawford has his hands full with a Buick Hawk and a mirror full of Porsche as Bryce Cobb tries to challenge for second place at Laguna Seca. Looking at V6 power up to about 900 horsepower. We talk about the Nissan, we talk about the Corvette being the big horsepower machines. This Buick Hawk gives up in the horsepower wars to no one. Bryce Cobb with that flat six Porsche turbocharged car. He's got about 725 horses at his command. So it's not really a, an even battle in horsepower, but Porsche's handle. Problem is at turn nine. Everywhere else, he seems to be uh, pretty, pretty equal to the Porsche. But that, that horsepower really helps. But he's got to have it getting off that turn. I think also, Lynn, that the handling of the Buick Hawk appears to be just a little bit ragged compared to the handling of the Dyson Porsche. Uh, looks like Crawford has his hands full just a little bit more than Price Cobb does. Although he's able to streak out under the power of that Buick Turbo uh, on the uh, fast part of the course, like turn three here. The cars are going 160, 170 miles an hour, and the Buick has a lot of power. I don't know, it appears that he was handling pretty good because the car seems to be pretty stable through the turns. Uh, either Price might be just driving a little harder because it seems a little ragged, but uh, they're both really obviously racing. There you see the turn four section, my favorite turn on a race course. There the corkscrew as Jim Crawford makes his way down. Bryce Cobb in hot pursuit. Now we've lost one of our cameras out there, so if you see us watching some of the cars further back in the pack, it's until we get our leaders back in view of another camera a little bit further on. As Bryce Cobb dives under Jim Crawford. Whoa. We don't need a camera to catch that one. That's two. <laughs> I think we're going to look for Price Cobb here to move out a little bit now and get into hot pursuit of Klaus Ludwig. There you see the power of the Buicks coming right up on the back of Price Cobb, and Cobb takes the inside line. Oh, Whoa. gets cut off by a lights car. But he'll get right by him on the shoot between two and three. And that really ties all three cars together. There's the number six car. Once again, that's Charles Morgan in a Pontiac Fiera. He was the, the car who spun out early on and has made a couple of pit stops. He's way down to the field. Right now, he's making life a little bit tough in the battle for second place. That was really a good opportunity for the Corvette to just get right close, right the door, right, right behind him. Once again, an in-car look as Bob Wallach of France takes us around. Down through the corkscrew, and boy, that must be absolutely breathtaking when you take that big jump off the top of the hill. Let's go down to Gary Lee with Darren Brassfield, Bob Wallach's teammate in the pits. In basketball, there's the sixth man, the first guy off the bench, and he never knows when he's going to go in and play, so he has to always be prepared. And right now, that's the way Darren Brasfield must feel, because usually you have an assigned second driver. You know when you're going in, about when the uh, pit stop will come. But right now, you tell me you really don't think you're going to go in. Right. This race is such a short distance. It's the shortest one we run. It's really not uh, meant for two drivers. So right now, we don't have a driver change uh, set up. It takes too long for the one driver to get in and get out of the pits and get up to speed versus uh, we leave Wallach in and we can take on his right side tires and fuel and just go again. 
So he's standing by just in case he's needed. Well, he may be needed uh, to help pick up pieces of cars as we watch the action as you listen to Darren Brassfield there. And these cars are flying around a race course. Looks like we had a little bumping there, Lynn. You, you saw the, uh, excuse me. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to comment that the Corvette has passed the, uh, has gotten by the Buick. And so I think we've, we've got a change here in the top three cars. We're seeing the billiard ball theory in effect here where the uh, GTP cars are using the camel light cars like billiard balls to bounce off around this course. And that's going to be a big factor in this race, how quickly the GTP cars can get by the light cars, especially in the fast parts of the course. The GTP cars cannot afford to be held up by the light cars. It can cost them one or two seconds a lap. I just watched that Corvette come off of turn nine, and he really can get that power down early. Uh, most of the time as we come through nine, we've got to kind of kick the back end to get the power. And Cyril was just on that power gliding through turn nine, which will also be able to be able to give them good tire, uh, to have good tire wear because he won't have to be sliding the car to get out of the turn. Another look from inside our VF Goodrich camera car. As you watch David Hobbs and the Nissan up ahead making his way around the number 29 Camel Lights car. Uh, Ron Canizera is out of New York. Closing up as they hit the curb and then dive down through the corkscrew. Looks like Wallach's having a very, very good race. He's being able to stay right with the Nissan, which has uh, considerably more power than he does. And, uh, I think that Wallach's going to be able to uh, get right into this race with the Nissan, and we might have some real action as the two of them pass the Camelite entry of Scott Schubert, number 19. It's also a tire difference there because the uh, BF Goodrich car is still uh, has the radial tires, and even though they, they are not really racing tires when they initially started the development, so it's a little bit liability there on tires, but he seems to be definitely holding his own. That's been one of the big stories this weekend at Laguna Seca, the tires on the Nissan. They use Bridgestone radials, developmental tires that they've been using, but after the wreck at Riverside, suffered by L.A. Forbes Robinson, in the name of safety, the Bridgestone engineers said, hey, we don't like the way that tire went down. Let's pull the radials off the car, go with the bias fly tires until we can get figured out what we need to do to make those radials a little bit more secure on the race car when one of them takes a puncture as it did at Riverside. We have a number of good races going on there. I just saw uh, Nifel in the number eight Primus car and the Lowenbrow car really tight close together. So a number of good races going on out there. Good shot there at turn four. Black Aller, you and I have talked about this before. That debris fence is a big help. Beyond that, it's a drop off into space for about 200 feet. Right, if you go over that fence, you end up in Stellinus. <laughs> there you see one of the lower ground porches being chased hard by the Ford. Good example of the diverse technology of IMSA Campbell GT racing there. Flat six, turbocharged versus V8. Six and a half liter, 389 cubic inches of Detroit iron. And right now, I'd say uh, Scott Pruitt in that car is holding his own. Absolutely. Uh, the, the horsepower is going to be in different places. You're going to have a horsepower advantage, but I'd say the cars are, are pretty equal overall. Now, that is Chip Robinson in the low and brow Porsche car there. As you see him making his way up on the number eight machine. Robinson, who was involved in that spectacular finish, heartbreaking for the Lowen Brow team at Riverside. Robinson lost some revs late in the race. His tires began to go away, and he was run down by the Jaguar in a tremendous finish. We expect one of those tremendous finishes here today. It's been a great race thus far. Stand by for more from Laguna Seca. West Germany continues to lead this Budweiser Camel Grand Prix. Quickly running through the top five. Bryce Cobb is in second, being chased hard by Sarah Vandermeer in the Corvette in third. 45, the Buick Hawk running in fourth position. And the 83 car, the Nissan, is in fifth. So it's Porsche, Porsche, Corvette, Buick, and Nissan in the top five of the GTP lights class. Uh, GTP class, excuse me, I'm thinking ahead to the lights racers. Bob, that's an interesting commentary because we would think the Porsche would uh, come on later in the race, being a good enduro car, being uh, maybe a little less powerful than the Nissan and the Corvette and the Buick. But uh, what's happened here is that Klaus Ludwig and Price Cobb have just taken uh, control of this race. They've taken it by the throat. They've left the Buick. The Buick a little bit behind them, and the Nissan a little bit behind them. Very surprising in the first 15 laps of this race to see that happen. Well, I'm wondering if Klaus Ludwig, using that superior Porsche durability, is trying to draw out those more muscle-bound cars, the Nissan and the Buick and the Corvette, maybe trying to get them to use a little more tires, use a little more gas than they might otherwise want to. Keep in mind that pit stops are going to be very, very important. Virtually all of the big GTP cars will make one stop. The Corvette, because of its thirsty nature, will have to make two stops. The lights class, the Camel lights race within a race. There will be no stops for those cars. 
I think that some of the Camel Light cars might have to stop for a splash of gas toward the end of the race. Maybe four or five gallons, kind of quick come in, quick come out. But uh, I think you're right, some of them will make it. The guys that will make it are going to uh, be a lot better off in the light class. Okay, you watch the 44 Jaguar, the Riverside winners, Hurley Haywood behind the wheel. Talk about technology. He's driving a car driven by a pipe organ, the 12-cylinder Jaguar. It's an absolute screamer. Those big velocity stacks make it one of the biggest attractions on pit road. Go by and look at the Jaguar. But right now, we're watching the number 45 Buick Hawk of Jim Crawford out of Scotland, now living in Dallas, Texas. Crawford is driving in fourth place now. He's uh, trying to chase the Corvette, driven by Cyril Vandermeerway. But the Corvette's got the wick turned up. I think the Corvette GTP has his turbo set just a little higher than most of these cars, and I think he's been laying back. I would look for him to come up behind the number 16 car, Price Cup. 52 is running very, very well now. Watching the battle on the racetrack, and this is for fifth position. Nissan presently holds it. Excuse me, the Buick presently holds it. The Nissan running along. There's a look from our inside in-car camera up over the hill where, Tom, you told me the cars come flat off the ground. Right off the ground, and Bob Wolick is driving very, very well. I think he's going to catch this Nissan. Bob is uh, driving very hard and uh, sticking right with the Nissan car. The Nissan car, remember, has probably 150 more horsepower than that Porsche driven by Bob Wolick, but Wolick is just sticking right with him. It's going to be a, a test of wills here between David Hobbs and Bob Wolick, two very, very veteran race car drivers, and I think they're having fun out there. Well, I just saw uh, David was really had that car about sideways and had to do a lot of correction to get through turn nine, so I hope it, it could just be that's the way he's got to drive. There's the Buick Hawk. Excuse Buick's me, Lynn. The Buick Hawk is, st is slowing on the race cars. 45 car has got smoke coming out the back end. It's a turbo failure, some kind of an engine malfunction, and Jim Crawford is out in the back side of the course. Oh, what a disappointment for the Connie Racing Team. And Phil Connie, they've been trying to get that car to work well for a couple of years now, and one mechanical breakdown after another has just stymied their efforts. They got a second place at Road Atlanta back in 1986, and that was one happy crew. But right now, the complexities of combining carbon fiber chassis, space age suspensions, and the big, big horsepower of that Buick turbocharged V6 is just a little bit more than they're able to, to get to work together. The Buick Hawk crew has another problem. They are the only Buick March out there, and they are struggling for parts. They're, they're really making a pioneering effort in everything that they do. They can't go over to the truck the way the Porsche drivers can and get a part. The Buick Hawk is its own car. They do everything themselves. It's a, it's a hell of an engineering challenge, but a tough way to go racing. Good point. The same thing applies to the Chevrolet Corvette and to the Nissan, which are basically one team efforts. And there you see Jim Crawford pulling on to pit road. And you can bet they'll have the hood up in a hurry to try to figure out what's wrong with that car. Well, they've obviously got engine problems, and uh, this early in the race, uh, maybe they can get back in. But he's uh, been able to keep the motor running, but as you see here, he's very, very slowly crawling into the pits. Uh, a dejected Buick Hawk team. Jim Tully and the crew waiting there in the pits. Tough break for 39-year-old Jim Crawford, recently married. Rough years this year in the Camel team. 21 laps into the race now as you watch Crawford talking. Looks like pretty much signs of dejection there as he unbuckles the belts. I imagine Jim Crawford will get out. Marty Reed is down in the pits. Let's see if he can throw a little more light on the situation. I'm with Jim Tully, Jim Terminal. The, uh, Jim says it appears to have dropped a couple of valves. We think it's a fairly serious engine failure. So you're out of the race? Uh, I'm pretty sure we are. We're going to take a look here right soon, but I'm pretty sure we're out of the race. Extremely disappointing. I know you guys thrashed awfully hard just to get the car back here in this week, and a great performance getting it on the front row. Yeah, we were, lo we were looking forward to better things, but... There's always more races. It was it was tough to get here, but that's the way it goes. That's it from the RC Cola crew. And there you see Jim Crawford with the Union Jack on his helmet making his way behind the pit wall. Well, the Buick may be gone, but there's plenty of racing still to come here at Laguna Seca. You're watching on ESPN. Stay with us. Bob Varsha, Lynn St. James, and Tom Blackall are with you for the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix, and you watch as the leader, Klaus Ludwig, in the number 85 Bayside Racing Porsche 962, makes his way down the start-finish stretch and into turn one. 
Bob, uh, Klaus Ludwig has been laughing at about one minute flat, which is a nice hot pace. He is not going to let anybody come up behind him, and he will pray that they don't get a full course yellow, because the way he's driving, he is just stretching the whole group. You see there, he's lapping the number 10 car, which is a similar Porsche 962, and uh, he's just going to go right on by. There's the gap to the second place car, the orange number 16 of Bryce Cobb, who's making his way, trying to make his way around. One of the Camel Lights competitors. No, that's not a light car. That's the 15 car, the Buick-powered racer that uh, Calvin Fish has brought out for the first time here on the series. And Bryce Cobb now is up behind the 01 Pontiac-powered GTP. That is the Camel Lights leader in class, Don Bell out of California. Giving a little room there for Bryce Cobb out of Evergreen, Colorado. As he makes his way down the chute to turn nine, hard on the brakes. He'll make the left turn onto the front stretch. Marty Reed is standing by now with Jim Crawford. Well, it's a disappointing day for Jim Crawford starting on the first front row, but the very first GTP driver out of the race. Uh, engine just let go. Yeah, I think something in the top end, a valve, valve spring or something like that. Uh, how disappointed are you? Because you guys really did work hard. I'm disappointed, obviously. It's the race. On the other hand, I'm quite encouraged because the car's going, going better and better. So hopefully this is just the start of a, an improvement through the rest of the year. Well, for Jim Crawford, it's now off to Indianapolis. Let's go back upstairs. Well, meanwhile, more problems on the racetrack. This time it's the Jack Roush Ford team. That's Scott Pruitt in the number four Mustang GTP. And he, it looks like, is not even going to be able to coast down the hill to make pit road. He's going to pull over and stop halfway down the hill. That's a reasonably terminal problem with uh, that number four car. And he's in a very bad spot because he's at the exit of turn seven and the entrance of turn eight. He's in between those two spots. And uh, cars tend to get off the road uh, with alarming frequency at that point. So I can't imagine that they're going to let them stay there. It also indicates it's terminal because it's, all he'd have to do is continue coasting down and could have made it right into the pit lane, so it must be something that he knows uh, could not be repaired in the pits. Something must have seized up so that he couldn't let the car because it is downhill. All he had to do is roll to the pits, but he apparently can't do it. Action piling up there in turn nine as the number 14 Porsche of Chip Robinson makes its way through, followed by the 67 Porsche of Bob Wallach. And it looks like David Hobbs is having more than a handful of problems with that Nissan. Yeah, David Hobbs, going. excuse me. I'm <laughs> sorry, I was saying that we were going, we were seeing the back of the Nissan all the time through the in-car camera. Now we're gonna finally see somebody else because uh, Bob Wallach was able to get by the Nissan and uh, is now very close behind uh, Chip Robinson. We're going to take another look at that turn action, and we'll watch some of the passing go on at turn nine, which is where most of the passing has gone on through this whole weekend. Under braking, there you see Robinson underneath the red and blue Nissan of David Hobbs, and now Bob Wallach will lean over and, oh, use the Nissan for a little bit of a, of a billiard bumper there. It's called using the other guy for brakes when you make the turn. It was really a double pass. It looked like uh, Wallach took advantage of that opportunity as Chip got by the, the Nissan. It was a, kind of a double opportunity. I think the Nissan missed the gear there when Bob Wallach went by him. And uh, here you see uh, the flying Frenchman uh, frogging his way along the course here. That was a Frog wonderful <laughs> shot. That was a wonderful shot to be able Watching to see the, man the, at work. the intensity in his eyes and the, the, uh, the concentration level. I mean, absolutely intense concentration. Bob Wallach well. used to be a, a championship ski racer, and he just loves to go fast. And uh, you're seeing a man at work here and also a man having a whole lot of fun. Regular day at the office for Bob Wallach out of Strasbourg, France. I understand also a... Uh, I would say a national class level tennis player, quite the all-around athlete, and quite an Iron Man. I recall last year at Miami, co-driving with Paulo Varilla in a Porsche, Bob Wallach drove two and a quarter hours through tremendous stifling heat in Miami before handing the car over to Varilla, who was making his first Camel GT start, his first street sports race, and he drove the last 45 minutes to the victory. But this man is made of steel, and he really knows Porsches. You can see the physical abuse there, and also the G-forces, how his body just sort of lowered in the car there um, as he was going through that particular turn. There were some G-forces that just did that to the body. So how did it look like the car was handling, judging from the way he was driving? I think Wallach is going to pass Robinson next. Here he's got his sights set on Chip in the number 14 Porsche. These are identical cars, but uh, it, it would appear that Wallach's car is just handling a little bit better. Now here Wallach will come right up behind Chip Robinson. Oh, he's going to go by the inside. Nope, off on the dirt. And now he's going to follow him through on the inside of turn four. Get shut off by the Alba car. 
uh, Wallach is doing a very, very, very good job here. And you saw a tow truck out there on the course. They may have been flying a little yellow there, but I sure didn't see it as you watch Calvin Fish in the red car there, the 15 machine. And now we've got another car slowing on the racetrack. That is Bryce Cobb, and he is on pit road. He'll make the sharp left turn and see if they can get that car figured out. Already a winner this year at Road Atlanta, but Bryce Cobb driving this entire race solo obviously has a problem. Uh, 30 laps into the race, Bob, this is a very serious problem. It's, uh, the race is no, not one-third uh, finished yet. This will not be a scheduled pit stop. It looks like a little bit of dejection in the cockpit of the Dyson Racing Porsche 962. Now Marty Reed is standing by in the pits. Yeah, where you've got the bonnet coming off of the car and they're reaching back towards the turbocharge area. Now, uh, whether or not he's lost the turbo and lost that power boost, uh, we don't know. In fact, uh, the Dyson team doesn't know it. Right now, they uh, have the motor completely shut down. This looks like it could be terminal. They're talking to Price and... Uh, the action is not fast and furious, guys. Yeah, there's the dejection from one of the crew members as the gloves get slammed down. And let's go to Gary Lee. There's no argument that the Fiat may be the fastest car. There's also no argument against the worst fuel economy. Consequently, they'll be pitting most any lap now. Ready to go in, but not being sure if he is going to go in is Doc Mundy. Uh, obviously, Zorro is very fast out there. So at this point, why would they put you in? Well, we're not sure that I would go in. It depends on a couple different factors. If Sorrow's so comfortable, he's staying in. If we don't think that we've got a shot at it, they'll put me in. <laughs> well, actually, it is a two-pitch stop race for you, so you'll likely see some action later. Probably later. Yeah. Well, no matter what happens, he's ready in case he's called. And as Doc Bundy stands by, you watch Saral Van de Merva, originally from Port Elizabeth, South Africa, now living in Indianapolis, Indiana, a nine-time South African National Rally Champion, and he can make that Corvette sing. Doc Bundy's a good driver, too. He's, uh, he's being a little bit over-humble, saying uh, they'll put him in if they don't have a chance. He is one heck of a race car driver, and they've got a good team there. I just clocked Cyril at a 101, so I know that he's very, obviously very comfortable in the car, and as uh, Tom said, Doc's an excellent driver, but I think once you get into a rhythm here, and if you're really comfortable, you just don't want to disrupt that. You're back watching the leader, Klaus Ludwig, once again. One other note on the Corvette. Their engines are made at Ryan Falconer's shops in nearby Salinas, California, and there was talk of putting a second Corvette out there for Doc Bundy, but they decided not to make that move. And now you watch our camera car with Bob Wallach aboard hits the pits. And this, too, has to be seen as a fairly early pit stop. This is a very early pit stop because I believe the Porsche could go at least 60 laps. So there's some kind of a strategic move going on here. Maybe new tires. Well, they are definitely putting four new tires all the way around. I'm looking to see if any of them had been cut down, but uh, not able to tell so far because I can't see the right side. Now we've got fuel splashing along the side of the car, but no fire, no flames. The car's back out 29 seconds. I'm guessing Mr. Wallach was just using those tires pretty hard and realized that, you know, for him to keep this pace up, he had to take that shot and go for the, uh, the new tires. We should point out that Bob Wallach is a master of car setup and tire selection. This team was out testing last week with 67 different tire compounds, and the fellows from the BFG team told me it was just like watching a man playing a Stradivarius. Wallach would use this compound on this wheel and that compound on that wheel in trying to help the tire engineers come up with the BF Goodrich radials that would allow him to maximize the performance of this portion. A true master there at uh, what you're referring to and that chassis setup and that development. He's a thinking man and a, an excellent driver. He was driving one of the original factory cars that has been rebuilt by Jim Chapman's studios out here in California. It was damaged last year, or this year that is, at the Miami Grand Prix in a practice accident. But it has been competitive at Road Atlanta and Riverside this year. And if there's one man that can take it to a victory in a short race like this, it's the man behind the wheel right now, Bob Wallach. Let's go back down to Marty Reed. Well, we can tell you what happened on the uh, Porsche 962 BF Goodrich car. This is what they call a, a scheduled stop, 32 laps in. They're not getting the kind of fuel mileage as some of the other Porsches. Are. We're talking about uh, the Nissan also. We just checked with them. They are going to hold off for an, at least another 15, 20 laps before they bring David Hobbs in. Well, here we see the 67 car having uh, changed the new tires, and Bob Wallach is driving the hell out of it, and uh, I think he's going to uh, be a factor in this race. Whoa, you saw him up on the curbing. He's definitely going after it here at Laguna Seca. Plenty of racing still to come, and we'll... Back.
continues. We saw Bryce Cobb pull his Porsche onto pit road a few moments ago, and Marty Reed talked us through the pit stop where they were apparently working in the turbocharger area. He came back out, and it looks like he's back, but it doesn't look like he's back to stay. For a little more on this interesting Cobb car, let's take a look at a track fact. Power and handling. Therefore, many of the GCP teams this weekend are utilizing the special wing on the front nose. Consequently, through the fast portion of the course, from turn nine up to the gears, through one, two, three, into four, there's more downforce. That generates more heat on the front tires, and the more heat we have in the tires, the better the car handles through five, six, the corkscrew, eight, and into the tight turn number nine. Well, right now, it looks like Bryce Cobb is going to need more help than that nose wing can give him. Let's go down to Marty Reed in Dyson's Pits. What's happened, guys, is that uh, they put the car back out on track because they need 40 more laps to get points. So Bryce Cobb is just going to be out for a Sunday afternoon drive with an awful lot of fast traffic around him, just for a few extra points. Well, points are certainly important to Bryce Cobb. He presently stands in second place to Chip Robinson, 85 points to 51 after five races. So those points are very important. Bryce Cobb also the defending winner of the North American Porsche Cup, honoring the outstanding Porsche driver of the year in North American racing. But I would say 40 laps is certainly more than that car is going to be able to manage. There you see the leader once again, Klaus Ludwig. As you can see, he has led from the drop of the flag, and he has done it very, very aggressively. I tell you, this is uh, probably a perfect scenario for Klaus Ludwig because we have some cars wanting, already planning to make two pit stops, like the BFG car. We know the Corvette's going to have to, and Klaus is just out there driving that racetrack, probably with the total you know, knowledge that he's going to be able to do it in one stop, and it's, it'll be a perfectly clean race. There you get a good look at Klaus Ludwig, the young man from Bonn, West Germany. Has a wife and a couple of kids back in Germany, but he loves to come and drive for Bruce Levin's Bayside Disposal Team. This car, as I mentioned, is a factory chassis, the 22nd uh, Porsche 962 built over the Porsche factory. Bruce also has a chassis built in Al Holbert's Porsche North America shops in Warrington, Pennsylvania. That car, the Holbert chassis, is for sale, but Bruce wants to hang on to this one. He at one time owned the second factory 962 set. That one's going to be a collector's item, and I'm not going to let go of it. You notice he's got his headlights running, which he does that all the time. It's something that he does because that way you, it's another way for the drivers to know that he's going to be overtaking, particularly the slower cars. So it's a, it's a tradition they probably, I know they do it in, in Europe, and they do it at Le Mans, and uh, Klaus has always done it even during the day. Klaus has been racing here at Laguna Seca for many, many years. I remember him here in a turbocharged uh, mid-engine Mustang that Bob Riley designed some years ago. And here's the lights leader, the 01 Fiero of Don Bell and Jeff Klein. And they are cruising along, lapping at about a minute and four seconds per lap, which is some four seconds slower than the faster cars. But that Fiero of Bell and Klein, last week's winner at Riverside, is now in ninth place overall, about to get passed by the second place car, the uh, number 52 Goodrich GTP Corvette, driven by Sarah Vandermerwey. You'll see the power of the Corvette here just blow off that three liter Pontiac and uh, come chasing after Bruce Levin in the 86 Bayside Porsche. That is the second uh, Bayside Porsche in the race here. So Sarah Vandermerwey is picking them up and putting them down and he continues to make his way around the racetrack. Uh, we mentioned that 0-1 car before, the leader in Camel Lights. Don Bell is on a roll. He has won three races this year out of five contested, including two in a row coming into this event. This is his home track. This is where Don Bell wants to do big things at Laguna Seca. He has a long history of running Sports Car Club of America events. He ran an e-production with an old Datsun, but now he is up there in the lights glass and doing really well. There you see the number eight car. Now, Chris Neifel has gotten out. This is what we talked about earlier. Two drivers making the driver change. Not the move you want to make on a short racetrack like Laguna Seca. Keep in mind, no team has ever won this race after making a driver change. It just takes too long. But Chris Neifel, all six feet, six inches of him, has got a case of tennis elbow, and he was afraid he might not be able to go the whole distance. This is really going to hurt them, because you can do a pit stop and just fuel and put tires in in, in less than 30 seconds, probably closer to about 20 seconds. When you do a driver change, you know, it's well over 30 seconds. I mean, we practice it, and you can do it in 30, but it, it's going to take about 35 or 40. Well, no loss of talent behind the wheel. You saw Brian Redman has taken over. Brian, the 
a man of incredible international racing experience. He has done world endurance events with Porsches. He has driven at Le Mans many, many times. In fact, he may go back and run again this year at Le Mans at the age of 48. So Brian Redman back behind the wheel. But right there, you're watching Saral Vandenberg in the 52 Chevrolet Corvette, owned by Rick Hendrick, who fields three Winston Cup NASCAR teams for Jeff Bodine, Darrell Waltrip, and the Tim Richmond, Benny Parsons duo. There is your leader. That is the 85 car. Moments ago, Vandenberg passed an identical-looking 86 car. That was Bruce Levin's car. You're looking at the 85 machine of your leader, Klaus Ludwig, as he makes his way around through turn four and up the hill to five. Ludwig is almost half a lap ahead of the 52 car, who is just uh, coming out of turn nine now. So he has a very, very nice lead here, and Klaus is driving much more smoothly than some of the other Porsches. We've seen the number 67 Porsche in the pits already. We've seen the number eight Porsche in the pits for change of tires, for fuel. Meanwhile, Klaus Ludwig, the uh, winner, the uh, leader, is running. Marty Reed is standing by now as we look at Bruce Levin's car in the pits. Well, Bruce Levin has brought his number 86 Porsche 962 in just a little earlier than the uh, number 85 leader, Klaus Ludwig. The crew is working on both cars, so they're trying to stagger these stops. So far, he's up to 29 seconds. Uh, if this is rehearsal for the next time around, it's not as good as they need for Klaus Ludwig. 34 seconds before he's back out. Yes, indeed, a slow stop for Bruce Levin. Keep in mind that these cars are laughing at better than one minute. It's the big GTP cars up front, so you can't stay very long. And here is the guy who is laughing fastest of all, Klaus Ludwig. Ludwig's obviously able to stay out a little longer because he's being a little bit easier on the tires. He must not have a fuel problem. Uh, I would think that these Porsches could run at least 50 laps without having to come in for fuel and tires. Uh, as we go on in the race, the drivers will try to go as far as possible on that set of tires and with that fuel so that they have fresh tires toward the end of the race when they might have to sprint even harder to try to win the race. That's right, Tom. You really need to do that because you've got to have as much rubber at the end and the track seems to get slicker as you go. And no matter how much rubber you have, it's never enough. So you've got to really hang on to that uh, advantage at the beginning and, and hang in there as long as you can before you do make that stop. Here's a race for third place between the number 14 Porsche of Chip Robinson and the 83 Nissan GTP driven by David Hobbs. Good battle there. We have a little trouble identifying Chip in that car because he and Al Holbert have been changing cars back and forth throughout the weekend. In fact, just before this race started, they changed the number on this car. He went from the number one car to the number 14. Al Holbert, of course, the director of Porsche Motorsport North America, brought a second car to this race to see if they could do a little development work and figure out what the problem is that they've been having, problems that have cost them the last three races. Marty Reed is in the pits. Let's go to him now. Well, actually, we're back in the paddock area with Price Cobb, who stepped out of the car. The turbo went. You were trying to get enough points to, uh, or enough laps to get points. Why are you back here now? Well, they wouldn't let us continue at that slow pace, so now we'll just change the turbo and go back out to do the same thing, just to get some points to try to stay in the championship. It's got to be frustrating for you. Pardon? It's got to be frustrating. Yeah, I thought we had a pretty good shot today, and then, uh, you know, we missed a little bit on the race setup, but it wasn't too bad. I was waiting to maybe catch up at the end. In traffic, Klaus was getting away from me, but on our own, it was pretty even. But, uh, yeah, it's a little frustrating, but we'll keep going. Is Klaus Ludwig setting too fast a pace? Can he hold it up? Oh, I think so, because I think we can hold the same pace. So, no, it's not too bad. Got it for Price Cobb, and we'll be back. All right, we watch as the battle continues for third place on the racetrack as Chip Robinson strives to hold off David Hobbs, but there's the 950 horses of that big Nissan against the 725 of the Porsche. Chip Robinson is leading the GTP Drivers' Cup right now and uh, is running now in a steady fourth place. Uh, Chip is a very, very good professional driver. Uh, he has managed to just start in, in the lead of the points and gain on points every single race. This being the fifth race, and Chip is uh, 20 or 30 points ahead in the driver's standings right now. So you're going to see Chip go very, very steadily and uh, race in a, at a very good pace to try to finish that 14 car in the top five. Robinson has already made his IndyCar debut, and he'll be doing some more driving in the big open-wheel turbocharged cars later in this year at the Meadowlands and thereafter. We'll be seeing some of that action as well right here on ESPN. But right now, he's got his hands full trying to run down David Hobbs. Now, here's the Corvette of Sarah Vandenberg making what is probably a scheduled stop for fuel and tires. Let's go down to Gary Lee. 
Well, this is a scheduled stop. Four tires will be changed. They'll top up the fuel. In fact, some very good fuel mileage for the Corvette. Cyril did not call in and say he wanted to climb out of the race car, which uh, we did not expect him to do. So Doc Bundy standing by with helmet on will not go in. No driver change. They'll change all four and top off the fuel in the Corvette. Still looks like a pretty long stop. 46 laps. Now, this raises an interesting tactical problem. We're not quite at the halfway. We're a couple of laps short of that. And because of that, can we estimate that Sarrell's going to have to make that other stop, or will he be able to go the rest of the way on this one stop? He actually went longer, I think, than, than we all anticipated. And, of course, if there's all we would take is a yellow coming out in that second half for some laps that can improve their fuel economy, uh, they may end up, uh, you know, in better shape than they thought. And here's what can happen to you. If you take a pit stop that's longer than it needs to be, that is the leader right behind him, Klaus Ludwig, trying to put a lap on Sarah Vandermeerva. It's going to be a very close call uh, as to whether Vandermeerva can make the 98 laps without having to come in again. We are 46 laps into the race right now, and Ludwig is going right up the tail of Vandermeerva trying to put a lap on him. It's going to be hard for him to do, though. Okay, plenty of action still to come, and we'll be back to Laguna Seca to see how things turn out right after this. Watching Klaus Ludwig, who has continued to lead this race since its very beginning. Ludwig hoping to become the first Porsche driver since Al Holbert in 1985 to win a race in a 962 here at Laguna. It is not a race that's been very kind to the 962 model. Let's go to Marty Reed. Well, Klaus Ludwig, of course, loves this track, winning here last year in the Ford Probe, and his fuel economy has been excellent. They're telling us here in the Bayside Disposal Pit they do not have to bring him in until lap 60. They're just hoping for a caution period to get away with a nice easy one. It's all looked pretty easy thus far for Klaus Ludwig. Once more down into turn two, a downhill turn, very high speed, and right here is where the new track section has been added to make that turn a little bit easier on these big GTP cars. It has really made it easier for everyone because you can pass now through that turn, you've got that little bit of margin, and you can, if you've got a clean lap, you can just let it drift out to the edge of the track. So it's, I think everybody's a lot happier that they made that change. Yeah, they took away the killer curb on the outside of uh, turn two, and it uh, does make the racing a lot better. Ten more minutes now, if our word is correct, and the 80 five car will be in the pits uh, for probably a change of tires and no doubt some fuel. I timed the stop, the uh, stop of the number 52 car was just about 30 seconds. So Ludwig ought to be able to get in and out uh, in under 30 seconds and maintain his lead uh, over the 52 car. Resetting the top five for you, the 85 Porsche Klaus Ludwig is leading. In second place is the Nissan with David Haas. Chip Robinson of the Porsche is third. The Jaguar, the 44 car with Hurley Haywood is fourth. And in, 60, in fifth place is the 67 Porsche being driven by Bob Wallach. There you watch the Corvette unwinding what many people say is 1,000 horsepower on the long straightaways. Let's go to Gary Lee. Well, Bob, we've known that the horsepower is there, the car is fast, but the fuel economy is not there. We intimated earlier during that pit stop that perhaps they are getting better fuel mileage, and indeed they are. But when I asked Bobby Hatch if they could go to the distance without a stop, he looked at his notes, shook his head, and said we're going to be four laps short. So it's still a two-stop race for car 52. And that could be heartbreaking if they manage to get this car up to the lead late in the race because a stop, even for just a splash of fuel, could be fatal. Yeah, that'll, that'll take the, any chance of the 52 car uh, winning the race out of it. I might think that they would try to take a gamble because if they come into the pits with four laps left, it's going to be uh, adios for them because Klaus Ludwig is going to stop at lap 60 here in about eight laps and uh, he only has one stop. I can't believe they would gamble it because they need to finish a race. If they finish second, at least they've got a good, strong finish. This team, you know, I, I, I know that the momentum is there that they have to be able to start finishing some races. So I think if they've got to do a stop and go with a dump can and get some fuel in there to finish a, you know, second rather than maybe sixth or seventh. And there is the leader. You see that Cyril Vandermeer has been able to open up that gap on Klaus Ludwig, who was trying to put him another lap down. Remember, Sarrell's on new tires now, so that makes a big difference. And uh, Klaus has been out there for 52 laps now on his tires, and he's cruising uh, well in the lead. I think he can get in and out of the pits and still be physically in the lead. So it's going to be an interesting race down to the finish. I agree with Lynn that they probably won't take that chance. It's, it's, uh, they do need to finish. There you see the Jaguar now, presently shown in fourth position. Remember, Hurley Haywood said at the top of the show, never take the Jaguar lightly. This is the mileage leader in Camel GT competition. These guys get 
All kinds of exceptional mileage out of their unturbocharged car. It's a V12 engine, it's light on its tires, and it runs very, very well in these sorts of situations that call for fuel mileage as well as easy handling. There you see Haywood putting a pass on Bruce Levin. Let's go down to the pits. Well, we're standing here in the Jag pit right now. The car that won last week at Riverside almost didn't make the starting grid today. They had a morning practice session. Everything was fine. But about 30 minutes before the start of this race, they went to fire the car in the paddock area. The clutch went out. They tore it apart, actually found the problem was the hydraulic system, so they completely changed the hydraulics and the clutch system on car 44, and it made the starting lineup. Now, we will have a driver change. John Morton will go in when Hurley Haywood makes the pit stop. Something we have not seen before in IMSA GTB racing are the tire blankets. They're actually warming these tires to near race operating temperature. So once the Jag makes the stop and takes on new rubber, the tires will be up almost to operating temperature for John Okay, thank you, Gary. And as we hear about the Jaguar, we see the Nissan of David Hobbs shown in second place on the racetrack, and right behind him, the leader, Klaus Ludwig Pitts. Klaus Ludwig uh, talking to Walter Ver Gerber in the uh, headset, and uh, they speak German to each other when they're uh, working on the, the pit stops and on the communication. Four tire change, the fuel going in. So far, we're up to 18 seconds on the clock. Everything seems to be cool and comfortable in the cockpit. Klaus Ludwig looks over and uh, gave us almost a little wink, it looked like. He uh, certainly underway with 28, 29 seconds, a little smoke underneath, and now they're having a little trouble getting one of the fuel stops out, and it's finally out, and now Klaus is underway. A slow stop, though, 37 seconds. In fact, a very slow stop. Now, that's something that could have hurt Klaus Ludwig dearly if he did not have this huge lead built up. That's about 10 seconds more than uh, the 52 car of Sarah Vandenberg took in the pits, but I believe that Klaus is out just ahead of Sarah Vandenberg. There we see Klaus going through turn two, and uh, Sarah is chasing him up into turn three. So uh, the, car, the two cars, one, two, the number 85 Ludwig and the... There you see as Ludwig makes his way around, you saw the Corvette at the back of the picture. And now we are being told that during that pit stop, the 14 car of Chip Robinson has taken over the lead. And what a surprise this is as you watch Robinson making his way around. Let's set that top five. It is now Robinson followed by the Jaguar of Hurley Haywood. The 85 car of Ludwig is out in third position. Bob Wallach is fourth in the 67 Porsche. And the Corvette of Sarah Vandenberg is fifth. So the long pit stop does jump up and bite Klaus Ludwig. We'll have to watch how this shakes out now. As Ludwig makes his way around, you're watching Chip Robinson, and what a break for these guys. They still have to make a stop, and keep in mind that a week ago at Riverside, California, a long pit stop and some mechanical problems that cropped up after they made the stop cost them the race to the Jaguar team. So we'll be watching to see what happens when Chip Robinson pulls in and Kevin Duran and the Lowenbrow crew go to work on that Porsche. Chip's got to come in pretty quick, Bob, and uh, this position he's got just in front of... Uh, the leaders is going to be eroded pretty quick, uh, even if he can make a 25-second uh, pit stop. And he must be able to come in fairly soon. We're 55 laps into the race, and the 14 car has been out there the whole time. Uh, so he will be looking to come into the pits, I would think, within about uh, four or five laps. Well, we'll be watching for Chip Robinson, our new leader, to pull into the pits. And the pits may well decide the finish here at Laguna Seca. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Chip Robinson gets a little bit squirrely off turn nine as he's challenged by the number eight Porsche Brian Redmond, but Redmond is a lap down and he will be trying to get that lap back. But right now there is nobody stopping Chip Robinson. It's time now for our mid-race report brought to you by Volkswagen. At the midway point, Chip Robinson was in fact the leader by less than a second. Klaus Ludwig, the overall lap leader, he took the green flag at the start of the race and never gave it up until a long pit stop allowed Chip Robinson to squeeze on by. Average speed of very quick, 107 miles an hour plus. Six cars on the lead lap. 21 cars remain out of a field of 25. The lights leader is the Fiero, the Pontiac driven by Don Bell. Out of the race thus far, the normally aspirated 
four. GTP of Scott Pruitt and Pete Halsmer. Steve Phillips in one of the lights entries. Bryce Cobb finally gave up and parked his Porsche. And you saw Jim Crawford in the Buick, the first car to go out. Now here is our leader, Chip Robinson, making his way onto pit road. And this is critical. We'll try to get some idea of how long this stop takes. He's not going to have much time. Here's Gary Lee. He stopped right on the money after almost locking up the brakes. Apparently it will be a four-tire change and the one uh, commanding the pit stop right now is Al Holbert himself. He was scheduled to drive the number one car. I asked him why he didn't start. He said, oh, it's a long story. We elected not to. So right now he is running the operation from the pit area, topping off the fuel, changing four tires. Chip Robinson will go the distance in car number 14, working now at 23, 24. This could be a fast stop. Still working on that right front. That is slowing them down. This could cost Chip a victory, a slow pit stop. They're having trouble with the right front. And obviously from our vantage point, we cannot see exactly what the problem is. Three, four crew members over there working on it right now. Now they run away, now they run back. Trying to get the air hose out of the way. The tire off the jack, we're up to 45, 46, almost 47 seconds. So what could have been a very fast stop gets hung up on the right front. Well, it certainly cost Chip Robinson the lead, and right now you're watching a battle for the lead. The Jaguar 44 of Hurley Haywood leads the number 52 Corvette of Sarah Vandenberg, and that is for the lead, ladies and gentlemen. You see in the background working the number 85 car of Paul Ludwig, who will not need to make another pit stop. The 52 car of Sarah Vandenberg, who's dogging the Jaguar right now, will have to make another stop. It's calculated by his pit crew that he needs to make a stop about five laps from the finish. And Hurley Haywood basically lets the Corvette go by. I'm amazed. And now Klaus Ludwig goes by as well. We have not seen the Jaguar pit. We are approaching 60. In fact, we're past the 60 lap mark, so we expect the Jaguar will be in soon. But right now, Hurley Haywood is just waving the leaders goodbye. This is going to be a story of who can make their car last the longest. The 52 Corvette of Cyril Barnumary leading the race now, but we think he's going to have to make another pit stop. Klaus Ludwig behind him in the 85 car will not have to make another pit stop unless something goes wrong, and it could. And the 44 Jaguar will probably make one short stop. Well, look, we have some exciting racing out there. Klaus Ludwig is really, it's a perfect race for him right now. You know, it's, it's exciting on the racetrack, but he is in control. And as we speak, here comes the Jaguar. They're going to have to make the driver change. Here's Gary Lee. Well, the Jag is in. They are making a driver change as Hurley climbs out. John Morton will drive the anchor. He climbs back in, changing the tire, topping off the fuel right now at some 15 seconds. So one of the few teams that had planned to make a driver change. Now Morton has strapped in. They're cleaning off the windshield, still topping off the fuel. It's off the jacks, and Morton is underway, kills the engine, depresses the clutch, gets it going in about 28 seconds. Well, 27.3 by our official, unofficial watch. That's about three seconds, four seconds slower than they managed at Riverside when they were able to assume the lead with a combination of good pit stop and great driving by John Morton. You saw Cyril Vandenberg getting a little bit squirrely there coming down the hill. His goal right now, I would guess, is to open up as big a lead as he can over Klaus Ludwig, so when that gas stop is called for late in the race, he might have enough of a cushion to do it. But frankly, that is a tall order against a charger like Klaus Ludwig. I think so. I think right now he's just going to have a hard time staying ahead of him. He had a low building a lead, so I think he really, uh, that, that's going to be, you know, Klaus being right there just really keeps that intensity level very, very high because he's right in that mirror. There you see the gap. The Corvette disappears on the left side of your picture, charged after by a phalanx of Porsche 962, the number eight car with Brian Redmond behind the wheel. Klaus Ludwig in the 85 car and Bob Wallach in the 67 machine. Whoa, getting a little bit sideways there in four. Bob Wallach is driving a little bit harder than Klaus Ludwig here. You can see how loose the car is. Wallach is charging, charging. Here he is right up under the wing of Klaus Ludwig. Remember, Bob Wallach had also made that pit stop, so he's going to have to stop again. So that means that Bob Wallach and Cyril Mandeberger have to charge a lot harder because they have got to make that extra stop. Oh, and you saw Wallach on the grass there. We're going to follow along now as the, I think it was the eight car came in. Let's watch under braking here at nine. Back on the throttle, no room there. No. Now Ludwig made that turn just a little better than Wallach did and is pulling away. That's a, that's a question of Wallach clipping the wall, coming out. He must have clipped it right while we were inside the cockpit. I think as he went off onto the grass there between uh, six and seven, 
we saw them uh, we saw him get virtually half the car. He was riding right down the center line, and it looks like maybe it chopped off there. Now, yeah. that'll destroy the downforce on the front of uh, Bob Wallach's car. He will not be able to turn the car into the turns as easily, and uh, this will slow him up at least two or three seconds a lap, but uh, he looks to be very determined. He's not coming in or even thinking about coming in. Okay, we've got a replay here. We'll get another look at exactly what happened to Bob Wallach. Here from our camera, high above the front straightaway, you watch him get a little bit sideways and off go the right-hand side wheels. He just was carrying a little bit too much speed coming through that turn, so the exit just took him off the track, and, and he saved it very nicely, but unfortunately hit those bumps, which then caused him to lose the nose. Not only will it not point in very well, but it will also be very difficult exiting turns coming out of the turns because he won't have the downforce to keep the car down. And he'll have a hard time coming through turn nine there. He just got into some little ruts on the right side of the road coming out of turn seven, and those ruts just took off the nose of his car. Now we have an update on the, uh, the story of the Jaguar. Gary Lee is standing by with Hurley Haywood. Gary? Well, Hurley has just been about 60 minutes in the cockpit and one of the few drivers willing to get a rest because most of the teams are going with only one uh, chauffeur. Yeah, we thought that uh, Laguna was is very tough on the driver, and this race is going to be close to two hours, and we thought it was a bit better to, to, to go with two fresh drivers. Now you become the cheerleader. We saw you a week ago at Riverside uh, cheering as much as anybody for Martin as he took the lead and went on to victory. Well, you know, you never can tell what happens. It's real slippery, and in the last... Uh, last 10 or so of my laps, the tires started to go off real bad. It was pretty uh, scary, and my seatbelt came unplugged. So driving around this place without a seatbelt on. Obviously a great workout for Hurley Haywood. Wow, aside from that, Hurley, how was the ride? Hurley Haywood, one of the great cool customers in IMSA Camel GT Racing, one of a number of Camel GT drivers who will be at Le Mans this year. In fact, David Hobbs and Klaus Ludwig will be in Silverstone, England next weekend to drive for the Yost Racing team over there in preparation for the 24 hours of Le Mans. Al Holbert, Chip Robinson, Bryce Cobb, Hurley Haywood, Cyril Van der Berbe, and a number of other drivers will go over and drive that great classic at the end of this month. We'll be back with more racing from Laguna Seca as we watch John Morton circulating around Laguna. We'll be right back after these important messages. Where ESPN and the International Motorsports Association, IMSA, are teaming up to bring you another great race on the IMSA Camel GT Trail. This ESPN coverage of the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix is brought to you by the 1987 German-engineered Volkswagens and your Volkswagen dealers. With 69 laps complete here at Laguna Seca, the number 52 Corvette of Saro van der Merwe is right out front. Klaus Ludwig in second place, the 67 Porsche of Bob Wallach is third, and the 83 Nissan of David Hobbs is fourth, followed by the Jaguar with John Morton now behind the wheel. We're watching the battle between 14 and 44 for fifth position on the racetrack right now. Keep in mind, we mentioned it earlier, no team has ever won this race after taking the time to make a driver change. The Jaguar team did it. We'll see if John Morton has the horses he needs to make it two in a row after winning at Riverside one week ago. Behind him is the man that he snookered for that victory, Chip Robinson in the Porsche of Al Holbert and the Lowenbrow team out of Warrington, Pennsylvania. This is a little bit of a reverse of what we saw in Riverside last week. We see the Jaguar leading the Porsche going into the uh, final stage of the race. What happened last week was just the opposite. The Porsche was leading, the Jaguar prowled up behind him and jumped him with five laps to go and uh, got a well-deserved victory, the first victory for Jaguar uh, in the IMSA series this year. Five different winners in five different races as we watch Robinson come right up on the back wing of Hurley Hay uh, excuse me, of John Morton. Five different winners this year, and that makes for real diversity. Lynn, you've been to all of these races, and you've seen just how competitive it's been out here. Well, it is, and I think if they have this many cars on the lead lap and to have everybody running as close, I mean, this, this particular track is really a driver's track, and now we've got Chip going by the Jaguar. Well, you talked earlier about what a clean pass was made on that same turn. It looks like the drivers are being very careful, and all of the passing has been 
pretty much bump free, except with the one exception of Bob Wallach leaning on David Hobbs on the Nissan a little earlier. Uh, I'm very impressed with Chip Robinson. Uh, he, I think Al Holbert's been teaching him how to drive. Al's one of the cleanest drivers, as is Chip. You see Chip get right by the Jaguar here. He really doesn't slow up either car. Clean pass out and uh, on into a position to challenge uh, the Nissan car. Keep in mind, the Nissan you saw disappear out the bottom of your screen there is in fourth place. So Chip Robinson can take another step up. He can move on up. And John Morton breaks for the, for the corkscrew. It, you know, Bob, we talked about how competitive this is, that the grid was really tight, and now we've got this many cars on the lead track, on the lead lap. Um, one of the th reasons, I think, is this track is a great equalizer. It's a horsepower track as well as a handling track. You've got to have everything together, and it's also a driver's course. Whoa, and deja vu as Chip Robinson gets underneath David Hobbs just one lap after doing the same thing to John Morton. So Chip is now in fourth place, and he's heading for third place. The car in front of him is now the 67 car of Bob Wallach. And I'd have to mention that 67 car is being driven uh, very, very hard by Bob, and he's going to have to make another stop, I would think, because he stopped at about 30 laps. So here comes the number 14 Porsche 962 passing Kenny Rodriguez in the Camel Light car. Up into turn four, Chip Robinson, I think, is one of the fastest cars on the track. At this instant, he is really running up for the lead. You heard Gary Lee talk to him a little bit earlier, mention that he had talked to Al Holbert, and that Al decided not to enter the other car in this race. We thought he was going to be out there. He may have started it and pulled it off. I didn't see that. Al was not intending to be here at all, but after three straight second place finishes with mechanical problems, as Chip, I think, gave a little nudge to the 43 car, Chip Mead, right there. Al Holbert was not intending to be here, but after those three straight second place finishes, he decided, hey, we need to get another car down there and see if we can find out what's causing problems. Normally the most bulletproof of all the Porsche teams, Chip Robinson appears to have things hooked up pretty well right now. And the stopwatch starts, we'll see what kind of times Chip is turning. You bet he does, Bob. I think Chip's got the tires, the motor, and everything going for him this time. Uh, opposite from what happened at Riverside a week ago, Chip is now uh, really hot-footing it. And I would guess he'll, he's going to be lapping around a minute because uh, he looks to be uh, some considerably faster than the rest of the cars out here at this time. Keep in mind that the cars qualified at about 56, 57 seconds for the very fastest cars in the field. You're watching David Hobbs in the Nissan. The lap time is actually for Chip Robinson. We'll pick him up by the time he completes his lap. There goes John Morton in the Jaguar, but here is Chip Robinson down through the corkscrew. How is he driving? He's got clean track. Lynn, how does he look? He looks absolutely clean. He's right on the line. He's not, uh, you know, he's not horsing the car around. He's not having to do more than, than what the car should offer and deliver. So I'd say he's a very clean, very clean line. Okay. And he's not using the tires up too much. And Hurley had mentioned it was slick out here, and yet he seems to be just absolutely right on the money, right perfect. Bang, right at one minute. And that kind of time on this racetrack calculates right up around 112 miles an hour. Fastest lap in qualifying was turned by Klaus Ludwig at 120 miles an hour. So Chip Robinson right now is moving right up into the range of qualifying times for a lot of the cars in the field. You know, Chip was so dejected after that Riverside incident last weekend uh, where he was just really, he was just so depressed and discouraged about what happened. And I, I have a feeling that he's probably got a little new fire in him now because things are, obviously the car's working well and he can, he can just get out there and, and get back to racing and wipe Riverside out of his mind. There you see David Hobbs and the Nissan make his way around. You saw a graphic earlier that pointed out that his two best finishes this year have been a couple of ninth place. We should point out that he did those in two separate cars. This is the fifth race car, different type of race car that David Hobbs has driven this year on the Camel GT circuit. He would definitely get the variety award year end if he keeps up this pace of changing seats as the year moves on. As David Hobbs moves under the Nissan bridge in the Nissan GTP, we'll bring you back to the action at Laguna Seca in Monterey, California, right after this. Laguna Seca, you're watching the leader, Saral Vandermerva, in the middle of that group of three cars in the menacing black and silver number 52 Corvette. Making his way up behind the number 10 Porsche of Jim Adams and John Hotchkiss. We're several laps down at this point. We expect that sometime between now and the end of the race, that Corvette is going to have to pit as the gas tank runs dry. But right behind Vandermerva is the 85 car. That is Klaus Ludwig in second place as they jam up like an L.A. freeway traffic jam. Saral Vandermerva with Ludwig in his mirrors. Now the psychological battle begins. 
Van der Merwe watching Ludwig, knowing that he's right there if he's going to stop for gas. But does Van der Merwe have to stop? He made it almost a halfway before his first stop. So we don't quite know just how far Cyril Van der Merwe can go as you watch him squeeze inside of Jim Downing and make his way up through turn nine. What does Ludwig know about the ability of that Corvette to go the distance? Must Ludwig pass him in order to ensure himself of staying in front of the Corvette to the end? Gary Lee has a comment on the Corvette situation. Well, while we question as to whether the vet will have to make a stop, there seems to be no question here in the vet pit area. They are saying yes. They're saying they'll need about five more gallons of fuel. I asked Bobby Hatch if there is a fuel light on the car, and he said yes, there is. We also have a reserve tank of three gallons. So when that light goes on, Cyril can flip the reserve tank, come in. It may take four or five seconds to get just enough fuel for the vet to go the difference. Difference. And right now, he does not have a large enough lead to come in for that splash of fuel and still retain the lead. Let's go on a pit road to Marty. Well, we are at the Bayside Disposal Pit. Klaus Ludwig's crew is saying, hey, we don't need that stop. We're going to go the distance. They're just waiting for the Corvette to come in to take over the lead. Corvette is doing all he can to get out and stretch that lead. He's off the course of the exit of three. He's off the course of the exit of four. He's driving much harder than Ludwig is, and still Ludwig is staying right with him. So Klaus is uh, driving a very cool race and just stalking the number 52 car. I don't even know if Klaus knows that 52 has to come in. I think Klaus is just driving his own race and just driving his pace. Well, so much for the drama. Obviously, Klaus Ludwig's crew is telling him to just stay where he is and let the Corvette just burn itself out. There you see, this is the camera that wasn't working a little bit earlier for us. We're glad to see it's back up because this is the picture you get as they come up over turn five and break hard for the turn six corkscrew. The Porsche is working a little bit better than the uh, Corvette up into the hard braking area of turn six. I think that Klaus probably won't try to make a pass there. It's a little bit too dangerous because the cars are real light on their feet there in turn six. But uh, if uh, the brakes are working as well on the Porsche as they look like, you can see them closing right up here to the Corvette as they enter turn nine. But the Corvette has all that power. That V6 motor probably is pulling some 800 horsepower, whereas Klaus has about 700. You saw Klaus take a look to the inside, but no pass just yet. Gary Lee has a comment. Well, we saw a lot of activity here in the Corvette pit. I ran over to Bobby Hatch. I said, what's the problem? You guys are going for tires. He said, Cyril just called in and said, I want rubber. So apparently what we had anticipated as a splash and go stop will now become a full-fledged pit stop to take on rubber. If that happens, count the Corvette out of competition. Well, I don't think we can ever count this Corvette out. The way this car is running, he is really driving hard. He's slipping all over the track right now because he's run out of tires, and he really doesn't want to come in, knowing full well that the 85 Porsche of Klaus Ludwig does not have to make a pit stop. So you can bet Cyril will stay out as long as he can, but you can see the rear end of his car wiggling all over the place. That means that car is nearly out of control, and he needs new rubber. All that horsepower coming down, and there's Ludwig who dives inside. He's not going to wait for the pit stop. Klaus Ludwig wants the lead, and now. So make it Klaus Ludwig over Cyril Van der Merwe. Lynn? I would say that when, now that Klaus has gotten by, Cyril knows he needs tires, he knows he's going to have to get fuel anyway, that he's got to he's got to run his own race, he's got to be able to come in, get fresh rubber, and, and get his, uh, his fuel, and then get out there and drive as, just as hard as he can. And you here saw. comes Bob Wallach uh, who made his stop. I can't believe that he didn't put a new nose on it. He had to come in and probably get that rubber and fuel. So and now now that he's, he's, he's got new rubber, so he'll have good traction, but he still doesn't have that nose, so he's going to have a, a, a limited traction uh, because of that not having the downforce in the front. Uh, one thing I know that, that the corner that is off is the right corner, the right front corner. Uh, most of the turns here at Laguna Seca are left-hand turns, so he still should have some pretty good stick on the, you know, the inside left turn. Uh, that's where he gets the bite, but it'll be really hard in the uh, in the right-hand turns as, as he comes down. Here he's coming through the corkscrew, and this next turn is where he was the he seemed to have the uh, most oversteer, meaning that the back end of the car is coming behind, and then the front end is also breaking loose because he doesn't have that nose. There you watch Bob Wallach at work. Day at the office inside the speeding Porsche 962. But Klaus Ludwig is the new leader and will be back. Chris in the pits. Let's go to Gary Lee. We are changing right side time. Oh, we've got a fire in the pit area. Fire. Quickly, they douse the fire. They douse the flames to the left.
left side, and they're trying to get the car restarted now. They're indicating to Vandermeer they will push him away. They want to get that Corvette back. <laughs> Excuse me, back in competition as we're down here in the uh, the exhaust, the fumes from that fire, and the vent now is out of our view and is pulling away. So it would have been a very quick tire change on the right side as flash and go, but then the flames burst out from the fuel. The vent is back in competition, and we'll regain our composure down here. Okay, thank you, Gary. Boy, talk about an eventful pit stop. That fire is similar to a problem they saw at Sebring earlier this year. Something about perhaps the location of that fuel loading nozzle that causes problems. Here's another look. As the fuel nozzle comes off, you'll see the fuel spray out and hit the hot exhaust and ignite on top of the car. Now, this is a, a relatively minor fire, which is put out immediately. Well, it shows how those corner, those uh, crew members, and it is required that someone be there with a fire extinguisher, and he was there, he was ready, he reacted properly. It also caught fire in Miami a little bit earlier this year, so perhaps we need to take another look at how and where they load fuel or exhaust gases from that car. You saw two fire extinguishers, though, right on the scene, and you also saw that, saw that everybody in that pit area was wearing flame-resistant clothing, so that's a good situation. Here at this racetrack a year ago, in a problem involving the Nissan in practice, a crewman was, uh, was burned in an incident on pit road. We're happy to say he was okay. In fact, he's back here working in the Nissan pits this year, but fire is always an ever-present danger in the pits as we watch the leader Klaus Ludwig followed by the Corvette still shown in second place despite that long pit stop and all of the problems Chip Robinson in third with the Porsche fourth is John Morton in the Jaguar and fifth is David Hobbs in the Nissan but he is now a lap down with seven to go with seven laps to go we got a fairly close race between the 14 Porsche of uh, Chip Robinson and the 52 car of Sarah Vandermeer but Vandermeer remember has new rubber right now so he should be able to hold that second place pretty easily okay we'll be back getting down to the end of the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix here at Laguna Seca you're watching it on ESPN don't go away we'll be right back Seiko with a half dozen laps to go and Klaus Ludwig is back out front. He took the lead at the green flag of this race then dropped it later on as the uh, long pit stop held him up and he passed the lead away. Then he engaged in a furious battle with the Corvette of Cyril Vandermeerva until Vandermeerva pitted. Klaus Ludwig passed him just before that pit stop and Klaus Ludwig is the leader. Here is the leader in the Camel Lights category. Don Bell in the AT&T Collins and Aikman Pontiac Fiero GTP looking for his fourth win in six races this year. You see him pulling up on the number six Pontiac Fiero of Charles Morgan and Jim Rothbart, an identical machine. In fact, these two cars run out of the same race pits. They are maintained by the Spice Engineering firm under contract to Pontiac and to these teams. They are identical race cars, but right now one is about to put the other a lap down as Don Bell makes his way around at the head of the class in Camel Lights. And the 01 car is running very well. The amazing thing about the six car is that he he survived a 360 degree spin about five laps into the race. This car right here knocked the whole front end of the car off, went into the pits, changed it, and is now running up in the top ten in the lights division. Don Bell downshifting and breaking hard for the turn six corkscrew. See him make up a little bit of ground there on the Morgan Rothbach car. A little bit of rubber flying off the wheels there. Things getting very slippery out there around this 1.9 mile circuit. There's the number six car. None the worse for wear despite the spin that Tom just told you about. Now back up front with Klaus Ludwig in the 85 Bayside Disposal Porsche owned by Bruce Levin. Look how bumpy it is as they make their way out of seven and down towards eight. Klaus Ludwig has what amounts to a cruise to the finish here as he crosses the finish line for this lap. He will have completed 94 laps. Here he comes through turn nine, first, second, third gear. And by the time he goes under the bridge, he'll be in fourth going about 120. Now into fifth gear going 140 miles an hour and down into turn two. You see him cruise through turn two at 150, 155. Enter turn three at about 160 miles an hour, flat out right through turn three. Boy, that's exciting. A great driving performance today by Klaus Ludwig. As you see him make his way up the hill to turn five, and look who's back in it, the 16 car of Price Cobb. He was parking that car a little bit earlier. He talked to our men, Marty Reed and Gary Lee down at Pitt Road, said it didn't look like it was going to make it. 
but apparently they have gotten that car back together and said, hey, Price, let's get back on the racetrack. There are points to consider. And there he is, Bryce Cobb out of Evergreen, Colorado, back in the race. Many, many laps down at this point, but Bryce Cobb is in there to try to maintain his second place position in driver points toward a year-end point fun. Watch the interval now as we wait for the next car to come around. There come my friends event. in the Camel Light car. Kenny Rodriguez is having a great battle for fifth place in Camel Light. The 19 car, the little yellow car behind him about 100 yards, has been there for about 20 laps. I've been watching this little race having a slight interest in this car. In fact, about a one-third interest. In fact, uh, when are we going to see you back in that car, as a matter of fact? We plan, plan to run in Portland uh, July 26th and then uh, Sears Point August 3rd. Uh, that's if there's anything left here, if Kenny doesn't uh, put this car into the wall. But he's doing a great job. He's staying ahead of the yellow car. Here's a pack of cars behind him with Jim Downing, the Nissan passing him. David Hobbs making his way around. Hobbs presently shown back in fifth position right now in the race behind the Jaguar of John Morton. There's a good look at Jim Downing driving his number 63 Mazda Argo presently shown in second place behind Don Bell in Camel Lights. And that's a great run for Jim Downing out of Atlanta, Georgia. With 40 horsepower less than the Piero, it's a very good job. Here's the little 19 Mazda uh, Taiga car of Scott uh, Schubert and Linda Ludeman. They are chasing Kenny Rodriguez, trying to get up to fifth place in the Camel Light division. Another interesting example of the Camel Light class, Scott Schubert had to make a fuel stop in this race. This was a European version of this Taiga, built with the European 100 liter fuel load. In IMSA, you're allowed 120 liters. The car has not been converted to IMSA specs in terms of fuel road, so they are going to have to make a pit stop, unlike most of the, of the Camel Light's competitors. Now you see Cobb, boy, he seems to have a whole lot of race car back as he pulls right up behind the leader, Klaus Ludwig, that pair of Porsche making its way around, and it looks like Cobb will challenge and passes. Now, Price Cobb has a... Price Cobb has a new turbocharger on his car, and he's out there to break it in correctly, and uh, he wants to go by the leader just to show him that he's there. Klaus Ludwig has this race in hand. He knows that he doesn't need to make a mistake. He doesn't need to threaten anything, and he just doesn't need to, to uh, you know, satisfy his ego by just not letting Price go by. He needs to win this race. He wants to win this race. He knows he's, what tires he has left. Um, he's just driving, you know, the pace that he needs to. And I've, I've been noticing all the drivers here are absolutely just driving so well. This track is held up, but I'll tell you, it is a Rough. You're out there for 98 laps. You're tired. Here's the final lap now. Klaus Ludwig cruising through turn three for the last time up under the bridge into turn four. Downshift to fourth gear. 110 miles an hour around fourth gear. Light touch of the alligators and on up the hill chasing the number six or excuse me, the number nine camel light car out breaking into turn six. Very dangerous place to pass. Good pass by Klaus though. I was going to say, we saw him give up the place to the back marker, Price Cobb, and now you see him challenging a Camel Lights competitor as they make their way through the corkscrew. But I'd have to say, an absolutely flawless driving performance today by Klaus Ludwig of West Germany as he takes turn eight for the last time. The short shoot down to nine, and he's going to pick off yet another competitor before this one is over. On second thought, Shippey says, no, Klaus. Klaus decides to park in turn nine just before the finish. Oh, my. Well, here he comes. Be something. But here he comes, and the checkered flag waves for Klaus Ludwig. Well-deserved victory for Klaus Ludwig, who said to me in the pits before the race that he would uh, win the race in the first 15 minutes. And here is the Corvette of Saral Vandenberg after that white knuckle of a pit stop in which the car caught fire, but they got the fire out before any damage was done. And Saral Vandenberg has taken it to a great second place. I think when you consider how hard he had to drive this car to make two pit stops and still finish second against all of the Porsches and the Nissans and the other cars in this race, I'd say that's a great performance for the entire Corvette team. This team has to be very, very proud and very happy to have this high finish. A second place finish is very respectable. The car ran well and they've been plagued with problems of finishing races and I think they need to be very pleased with this. In third place is Chip Robinson in the number 14 Porsche 962. Chip will extend his points lead in the IMSA GTP circuit with this very strong third place finish. And in fourth place is the Jaguar of John Morton. David Hobbs comes home fifth in his debut effort in the uh, Nissan GTP. And here is your leader, Don Bell, in the Camel Lights category. He has taken the checkered flag, and he's decided he can't wait any longer to get a little bit of cooling air into that car. He's a little warm in that cockpit. 
definitely. Well, we'll be back to meet our winners in today's race and sum up the results for you from the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix at Laguna Seca Raceway in Monterey, California, right after this. Wig has won his second straight Camel GT race in his second different type of car. Gary Lee is standing by with Klaus. Congratulations, you made the comment before the race, the whole race would be won in the first 15 minutes. Actually, it was. Yeah, it's, it's always the same here in Laguna. It's, uh, action is so close in the beginning, everybody is uh, a little bit tight. And uh, so I tried to get in the lead as soon as possible, and it worked out, and it was fine for me. You had a good battle with the vet late, but obviously you knew he would have to stop. Yes, I knew that he had to stop because he, when I passed him first, I, I, I figured out that it was in lap 35 or 40. And even if he wouldn't have gone in for, for fuel again, he would have run out of tires. That was sure for me. But I still I gave him a little bit of fight, and finally I passed him. And that was, you know, that was a little bit entertaining. Is this quickly becoming your favorite racetrack now? Yeah, it seems to. I think I have to come back next year. But uh, yeah, I really like the, like the area, and I really, really like this track. Klaus, congratulations. Thank you, and I want to be, want to thank to Bruce Lebman and my crew chief Walter Gerber. He made it uh, possible. Okay. Wonderful car, wonderful car. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Gary, and let us add our congratulations to Klaus Ludwig. We'll be back to talk with the winner of a Camel Lights race today at Laguna Seca. Go away. hills of Laguna Seca, high above Monterey, California. We'll give you a look at the top five finishers in the Camel Lights category of today's race. Don Bell co-driving with Jeff Klein, although it was Don Bell wire to wire in winning this, his fourth race in six starts. Let's go down to Gary Lee with the winner. Well, Don, you made it look easy by not making that pit stop, but you tell me you had a problem inside the cockpit. Oh, I sure did. The uh, temperature was 102. We got a thermometer, and I wish we hadn't put it in. And the cool suit quit working on the grid, so around the whole race, and, uh, and probably about 120, 130 heat. Uh, so I'm fatigued. But that was the way to do it. We knew Donning was going to go all the way. The cool suit would have been a lot easier. The tires went off, but uh, thanks to another good motor and another good chassis uh, by Pontiac and Spice, we, uh, we made it. So I want to thank uh, John Kelly's and Pontiac and Paul Vanderlei, who built the motor, and the sponsors, uh, Collins and Eckler and AT&T. Hot or not, Don's on a roll. And the Camel Lights add another great page to the day's racing here at Laguna Seca on the International Motorsports Association Camel GT Trail. Don Bell is dominating the lights, but we have our sixth different winner in as many races in the GTP class. We'll be back to sum things up from Monterey, California, right after this. Bell and Camel Lights and Klaus Ludwig in the GTP class are our winners today. Lynn, your final comments on the race. I just want to congratulate Klaus Ludwig. He put the fourth in the, in the victory circle last year, and he put the Bayside Porsche this year. A true master. Tom, your thoughts? I think a great race ball, so by Bob Wallach, sixth or seventh place, but driving with no nose in the BF Goodrich Porsche, a great show. Today's coverage of the Budweiser Camel Grand Prix was brought to you by BF Goodrich Radials. We make your car perform. By Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Quaker State Motor Oil. New Quaker State with QSX keeps your engine cleaner to last longer. For Marty Reed, Gary Lee, Lynn St. James, and Tom Blackaller, I'm Bob Varsha. We hope you've enjoyed our coverage of the Camel GT Series from Laguna Seca 